Our first talk in this afternoon session is Ali Pomoni, who will tell us about some exciting news from N equal to superconformal field theories. Please, Ali. OK, so let's start. This is work. Uh, I mean, there was a paper uh, last year uh, which was exploring more the direction of whether we have integrability or not for N equal to two theories and how we can go about doing that. And uh, my talk today will be mostly based on a paper that whenever I have a week alone at home will come out. <laughs> and this is more about how to see quantum symmetries appearing for the spin chains of N equal to two theories. And uh, I mean, OK, honestly, this motivation is not needed in this crowd. But anyway, it's nice to start uh, uh, in a relaxed way. So yeah, N equal to 4 is integrable. People here are working on maybe deformations away of that. But my point is, can we honestly start removing symmetry from the gauge theory point of view and see how we can, in a systematic way, uh, keep or not integrability, how, when, and why. And I really want to emphasize the, the systematic way. And I hope that by the end, you will see the systematic way uh, uh, appearing. And I mean, also with the previous talks, like there are so many things that are in common. So I think by now, all of these different eta deformations, whatever, they should really, we should really come together somehow. OK, first of all, let me begin about the past. And in some ways, it's an apology about my behavior. So back in the day of my PhD, we computed already there the spin change for n equal to two theories. We checked the Young-Baxter equation. And we saw that it's not satisfied. And we very quickly said, oh, they are not integrable. And we got depressed. And then nobody wanted to work on them anymore. And that was the end of it. But so basically today, I will try to tell you that this was not a smart thing to do. Uh, so the fact that the Young-Baxter equation is not satisfied absolutely does not kill integrability. And let's go slowly first to say why. So we all know here in this room that integrable models are classified. First, we have rational models like XXX spin chain. XXX enjoys a full SU2 symmetry. The moment you go to trigonometric models, for example, XXZ spin chain, we naively have only a U1. But if you look closely and you are careful with what you how you play with your boundary conditions, you see that, in fact, there is a quantum SU2 group governing the spectrum of this uh, spin chain. And even more crazy, when the model is elliptic, for example, SYZ, there, naively, there is no symmetry at all. But again, if you do the job properly, you, in fact, see that there is a doubly uh, deformed SU2. And in fact, I want to also insist, because this will be very important when you want to construct crazy gauge theories, like of whatever you want, hyperelliptic models will come to play. And we know, I mean, OK, we know very little about these things, but we know they appear, for example, for the chiral, chiral pots. So there are examples out there. Uh, great. So now let's, uh, because I don't want to go completely crazy, I want to stay at a level that I can actually do things. Let's stick with elliptic models. And let's first make some comments. So usually when you have an elliptic model, it really depends on the basis you use to write down your uh, Hilbert space uh, on whether you will have a Young-Baxter equation or not. So the most usual thing, in fact, is that you get a modified or dynamical Young-Baxter equation. And this is what Felder did in 94. Of course, there is a representation, the representation of the R matrix from Baxter and Bellavin, which actually doesn't satisfy the usual Young-Baxter equation. But in that, uh, in that basis, so there is Kleanin algebra, and this acts on this Hilbert space. And with Kleanin algebra, you can show that there is no highest weight state on that Hilbert space. But this is really what we do not want when we are studying superconformal field theories. When we study superconformal field theories, we have BPS operators, and they correspond to highest weight states. So if you want to describe BPS uh, operators, you really need 
uh, <laughs> another algebra, not this Kleanian algebra. So in fact, you really need to go to something like a Felder algebra. Can I ask you, uh, yes. is this something that you can always do? For instance, in X, Y, Z, would there be such a basis where you have highest weight state, uh, but you don't obey the class? Yes, this is what Felder is doing for you. Mm -hmm. Th this is what Felder did, basically. So that, that, that would be the X, for instance, the X, Y, Z would fall into that? Uh, 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 this is precisely that, yes. Mm -hmm. This is precisely Felder's work. Okay. Yes? Yes, please. <laughs> Just a quick precision. I, is uh, wh what's the lack? Because what's the lack? No, what's the lack? Is that there is no highest way state and you want one, or so is that you cannot do a BA some kind of? What because is BA? Better than that. There is no, no. Here the problem is not that you cannot do better than that. That's the Baxter point. solved the problem with his uh, famous X Y Z. The problem is that there is no highest weight state. And okay. this, uh, like when you want to have BPS operators, and we know we have, you cannot, like th the correspondence breaks, basically. Okay, the the spin chain mm -hmm. operator correspondence breaks. With generalized ABA, you can get the highest weight state, for example. But uh, the point is not uh, the Bethian's. The point uh, is already at the level of the Hilbert space and the algebra. Yeah, that's what I'm talking about. So you about. need to have a creation or annihilation yeah. operator that kills the vacuum. And here, this, the BPS operators are the vacua. Good. And uh, this is all great, but there is even a little bit of a broader uh, mathematical framework uh, which we can actually use to study these models. And in fact, this is how I will go about. There is a framework of quasi-Hopf algebras. And uh, whenever there is uh, I mean, I am not going to go into detail and I will definitely not explain in a math, but whenever there is a Drinfeld twist, we always can construct a quasi-Hopf algebra and a quasi-Hopf Young-Baxter equation is obeyed. So this is the most general beast you can actually hope to get with phi being the co-associator. And if you want this general beast to be an elliptic integrable model, what happens is that there is a cosigal condition and the moment this concycle condition is satisfied, this general uh, framework goes down to a dynamical Young-Baxter equation a la Felder. So this is the way I'm thinking. So I will first show you that we have quasi hopf algebras. And then, I mean, I'm not going to do this in this talk, but the next step is to check the concycle condition. This is my way of thinking. Great. So by the way, uh, when Arkady was giving his talk, I already realized that I am horrible because when you talked about n equal to two theories, you cited the old papers from West, but I am already citing the modern, uh, so the classification of uh, n equal to two superconformal theories. So anyway, the point of this thing is that n equal to two superconformal field theories are classified, the ones with the Lagrangian description, of course. And we know them. There is, you open the paper and there is a complete list. And what you learn when you just open and look at the paper is that most of the n equal to four, uh, two theories that you want to study are in fact obtained by Orbi folding n equal to four super young mills. And this is really great and it was already there in Arkady's talk for many reasons. So first of all, we know the gravity duals and we can actually really play. We also know that at the orbifold point, so when there is no marginal deformation, we go at the center of the conformal manifold. There, we know that these theories are integrable the way we know and love about integrability. And the only thing we need to learn how to do is we need to understand how to marginally deform them away from the origin of the conformal manifold. That's the only thing we need to understand. Now, Again, Arkady had this uh, theory in his slides, but this is my nice way of writing things the way I, you know, like for more than 10 years now I'm writing things down. So I will study this SUN cross SUN uh, quiver. This quiver is obtained by orbifolding and equal to four super young mills by a Z2 orbifold. It has two color groups, one and two. And uh, I think that I allow for the two coupling constants to be general and different from each other. When the two coupling constants are equal, we are at the orbifold point where we know the theory is integrable. And the way I, I like to think uh, of this theory coming as an orbifold of n equal to 4, I think, for example, of the three scalars of n equal to 4 super young mills. 
as after or befolding becoming bifundamental in the case of X and Y, and in the case of Z, remaining in the adjoint representation. Yes? And maybe the only thing that I would like you to ask you to remember is that X and Y are the ones that are bifundamental, and this guy is in the adjoint. And maybe just the notation, just to clarify, when I write 1, 2, I mean that Q has one index in the one color group and two in the second. And when I write 2, 1, it's backwards. Yes? So that's the notation. And for the adjoint, one index is enough to clarify. And this, this model is, in fact, enough to discover all the things that I care to discover and to go away from that to more crazy and equal to two theories. It's, in fact, I mean, okay, I shouldn't say trivial, but it's a more tedious group theory exercise. So it is enough to discover something that the, uh, the, the, the spin chains are dynamical, which will be coming in my next few slides. Then to, it's also enough to see that the model is elliptic. And also, I, I write this here because everyone asks all the time, how do you get n equal to two superconformal QCD in the Veneziano limit? You just take this theory and you send one of the two coupling constants to zero and you get super QCD. Yes? So what is the plan from now on? So first, I will talk about, I will concentrate only on one loop. I have to say, we have uh, from the early days, 10 years ago, with Christoph Sieg, we have a, even a three loop paper, but who cares? This is too hard. Let's be concrete, one loop. Can we see integrability in one loop? So I will try to explain to you here why these spin chains are dynamical. And by the way, when I use the word dynamical, because also here is a community of people that have studied all the Bizert papers, so this is not what Bizert calls dynamical. This is what Felder calls, calls dynamical. So this is very different. Uh, so first I will do that very quickly. I will not give you the whole thing. This was the topic of uh, the first paper I cited with Costas. I will, in this talk, more want to concentrate on seeing the quantum symmetries appearing. So I will first try to explain how we can see the quasi hop symmetry algebra coming up. And then the moment we see this coming up, we will write down the R matrix in the so-called quantum plane or braid limit for some, depends on what is your language that you prefer, and how to read off the, the Drinfeld twist. And then the moment we have the Drinfeld twist, we just need to understand it. We just need to understand how to use it to have a nice co-product with which we can act on things. And then for this talk, I will then just show you how we can actually construct multiplets uh, of the BPS spectrum that they are actually bigger than what we thought is there just by knowing n equal to two superconformal algebra they will be some multiplets of some type of n equal to four quantum. So they will be just like n equal to four, but they will be somehow made by a crazy co-product. Yes? So let's go for this. Okay, first a little bit of one loop also to appreciate what is going on here. And please, pl please just ask questions if like my notation is crazy or, yes, please ask. So first, let's start very simple with the x, y sector. And why this is the most simple? Because people here are familiar with ABJM. And in fact, this sector is very similar to sectors in ABJM. It's a little bit more difficult, but still very, very, very similar. Uh, so how do we obtain this sector? You can always think that you start from n equal to 4 super young mill spin chains. By the way, when I write this cat, I think that I take an operator, I cut it open, and I draw the open chain, yes? So this is an open chain always for me. And then what you do is you use what I just had here. You use these fields. And by plugging in these matrices, you can immediately see that you get two possible n equal to two states, spin chain states. And the one is Z2 conjugate with respect to the other. And on the top of that, you can actually, below what I did is that I was drawing the color indices. So fundamental, anti-fundamental, fundamental, anti-fundamental, anti and group one, two, two, one. So that it's planar, right? So it has to be planar. And you can see that this is an alternating spin chain. So this, is, this in this sense, is very similar to ABJM. 
And the only difference of this state with respect to this state is that here I started with the color group index, open color group index of the color group one, and the second one of the color group two. And just by planar contractions, the rest of the indices are immediately uh, uh, determined. So in this sense, this simple alternating spin chain is a dynamical spin chain. You only give the initial information and the rest is fixed. In this sense, it's dynamical. And uh, so then, what is the correct way to label this type of states? Well, it's clear. We just use the n equal to four language and we just say, what is the first open index of the chain? And then we have specified all of our Hilbert space. Yes? The moment we do that, we can see what is going on very, very quickly, in fact. So these were the old Feynman diagrams that we computed, and we wrote down the Hamiltonian of the spin chain that acts on this basis. But now using this new dynamical notation, the basis can be written in this form. Right? And in this form, whether you pick i is equal to 1 or 2 means that you have this Hamiltonian or this Hamiltonian. And what does this mean? So both of them, they are an XXX uh, Hamiltonian. The only difference is that the overall parameter in the front of the Hamiltonian here is kappa and here is 1 over kappa. And by the way, with this kappa, I label the ratio of the two young mills coupling constants. Yes? So what do we have? We have an alternating XXX Hamiltonian. And it has to alternate because the spin chain, the Hilbert space, is alternating. That's the most important lesson on this slide. So the way you should think about it, this is a dynamical XXX spin chain. Let's do something harder. And this is where, like, the full glory, yes. Yes, yes. Why we're looking only at scalars? In equal 4, we know that that covers everything. What happens So here? The, the, what I am doing is enough to do everything because all the fermions then are in the n equal to 1, if you wish, super multiplet of x, y, z, and then I can just follow my indices. It's, it's enough to see all the new features. Yes. Okay, so this is now the, the, the one extra step of difficulty, but also beauty. Uh, this is the XZ sector. So X becomes by fundamental after the orbit folding, but Z remains in the adjoint representation of the one or the second color group. And when you do that, so here is the n equal to four state, you see what happens. Here it almost looks like it's good and that it's gonna be alternating. But these ones, when they start repeating, I don't quite alternate. I stay in the same color group. So for the people that know a little bit of statistical mechanics, this is a dilute model. Uh, so this is a truly dynamical uh, spin chain, and there is no way out of that. So it's not like the previous nice alternating guy. Of course, here is like before. The moment I know the n equal to 4 mother theory state from which I started, I only need to specify the first open index, and I specified my state. And also note that this from this, they are just Z2 conjugate with respect to each other, as before. This is a feature of the theory. There is this extra Z2 symmetry there. And uh, now again, you compute your Feynman diagrams, and you write everything down, and you go to this beautiful dynamical notation, and you look at the Hamiltonian. And what do you see? This, the people that have worked on XXZ, they know this is the temporary Lieb Hamiltonian. And the only difference from this matrix and this matrix is that kappa goes to 1 over kappa, like before. So what is this? This is a dynamical temporary Lieb uh, chain. That's what this is. I mean precisely this, that all I need to do I need to specify at one point of my chain the color index, and then everything else is specified. But I need to do that. Is it related to the fact that there are 
Yes, so this is where this this is where I am going actually. Yes. I mean, okay, I have to say, okay, so here we go to the apology slide. So this is not the talk that I will give today. This was what we did a little bit in this paper. So when I say dynamical, all the way the point is to go to Felder. So instead of just saying that there is a color index one and two. Exactly. There is a dynamical parameter inside the R matrix. And every time I cross it by fundamental field, I have to shift it. Now, the, why this problem? I, if it was just Felder, by the way, I would have solved the problem. And now we will be done. And we would say n equal to 2 is integrable. And we are all very happy. But there is a slight catch. The slight catch is the following. So we are clear that we need the dynamical parameter. And the dynamical parameter keeps precisely track of the color group. And there is no way out of that. The difficulty here is the adjoint fields, is this XZ sector that I talked about. And why there is a problem with them? When you cross a Z field, you should not shift the dynamical parameters because you stay in the same color. And what does this mean? In the statistical mechanical language of solid of so, uh, uh, solid, or solid models, this is a dilute model. So this is something that is actually harder than Felder. Of course, these things are studied, and we know a lot about them. And in fact, in this paper, we really wrote down, or, or like we explained what the vertex model that describes the SU3 sector of scalars sh should be. But unfortunately, this is not something that you can open a paper. There are very similar models that have been constructed. But there is not the model that we want is not written in a paper that we can just copy it. There is a, pop, a, a paper where they do a trigonometric model like this, but not the elliptic one that we want. But this is very close to what exists in the literature of statistical mechanics. So this is where this direction uh, uh, is. Are there any questions up to now? Because now we will shift gears. Yes, please. Probably this uh, dynamical Young-Baxter equation will take some modifications. So the dynamical Young-Baxter equation, depending on where you are on the chain, yes. it will be when you cross this X or Z, it will look like Felder. But when you cross uh, Z, it will not shift. It will be the same. Mm -hmm. That's what happens. In fact, it's really, really like Felder. You just, uh, let's say, add plus the shift when you cross an X. You say minus that when you cross a Y. And you do nothing when you cross a Z. That's how it works. Can it be interpreted as some other representation of the? Uh, that I don't know. But let's, so good. So now what I want, now I want to talk about symmetry. And what I have been doing the last some months of my life, I want to understand representation theory. And my hope is that if I understand representation theory properly, all of these questions will be just answered for me. So let's just try to go all the way to representation theory. Great. OK, so first of all, the fact that uh, we see quasi hop symmetry in spin chains uh, coming from gauge theories is absolutely not a new thing. And people have studied marginal deformations of n equal to 4 super young mills. And I mean, there is an infinity of papers. And uh, the way we will discover this is identically following what people did in the past. In maybe you could say a slightly more complicated way, because you also have to keep the dynamical plus the quasi hop at the same time. But that's OK. So what we do, here is a summary of what we do. First, we look at the f terms, as always when you study supersymmetric theories. And I will try to explain to you that they define a 3D quantum plane. The moment you have your 3D quantum plane, you can immediately, basically, just by looking at it, read off the R matrix in the quantum plane limit. By the way, then you can plug it in this eigenvalue type equation, and you can recover the, so you are very sure that you are doing the right thing. And then the moment you have this equation, you win, because you can, in fact, write down the quantum algebra. And not only that, you can also check, and this is very, very nice and very cool, that actually the superpotential of the, so the Lagrangian is invariant under this quantum group. 
So let's do it. First, I start with a baby discussion for what is a quantum plane, the most standard example from Manin. So we just have x and y two coordinates, and they don't quite commute because of this Q that is there. You open a book of quantum groups, you copy these R matrix, you plug it in this equation, and you get this back, and you are very happy, right? That's how we do it. And then you say, OK, now I want to understand the transformations that leave this quantum plane uh, invariant. And you write something like this. These are the transformations. And these are the things that will actually define for you your SU2 quantum algebra. And what you do to write down the algebra is you just take this R matrix and you plug it in the RTT. And this just gives for you the answer. That's how we do it. There's nothing to think about. Just calculate. Great, but we need three-dimensional quantum planes. And these are thankfully classified by mathematicians. So we just need to understand the math paper. And uh, I don't give here details, but all you need to know, the mathematicians told you, is two tensors with three indices. And once you know these two tensors, this is how your quantum plane looks like. And this is how your quantum coplane looks like. And by the way, for us, because we just do supersymmetric quantum field theories, the quantum coplane is just complex conjugate the quantum plane. That's what it is. So it's very simple. And the moment you have these two tensors, you are very happy because you can immediately write down your R matrix by using this formula. That's how it works. And this is a theorem. And the moment you have this R matrix, you can plug in the RTT and you get the quantum SU3 algebra that leaves this quantum plane invariant. That's how you do it. Now, this was done very successfully for the Lee Strassler, the marginal deformations of n equal to 4 super young mills. And many people in this audience know this very, very well. So here is uh, the quantum plane that is obtained by looking at the F terms. So these are the F term conditions. And equivalently, and maybe very cute and fast, is that you can think that instead of writing the n equal to 4 superpotential, which has the epsilon tensor here, you basically just have a more complicated tensor, which you can read off from the Lagrangian that you have. And that's all there is. You just need to know this tensor. And when you complex conjugate, you just complex conjugate basically the epsilon. And by having these two guys, you can immediately write down their matrix also the Hamiltonian obeys this equation. And you can prove to yourself that there is a full quantum SU3. So naively, when people started studying Lee Strassler, they thought that there is only U1 to the third. No, <laughs> there is a full SU3 quantum there. So we do the same thing. Ah, no, no, no. Before we do the same thing, I want to say how we should understand this from the ADS-CFT point of view. So what is the gravity dual of this uh, quantum plane? So the moment you have a B field, we just read uh, Seiberg and Witten. So what we do is we have open strings that in the presence of B field, when they end on the D3 brains, they see a non-commutative geometry. Basically, that's it. So the non-commutative geometry is the quantum plane. The open strings see a quantum plane. So our matrices see a quantum plane. That's what it is. And for the list Lassler, this was worked out by uh, Manuela, like su super many years ago, when I was actually a PhD student at Stony Brook. And uh, this is the dictionary f between the couplings and the B field. You can copy it from our paper, again, from my PhD days. So the same thing is going to happen. There will be a quantum plane because of this B field. Now let's just do it. So first of all, because we have an orbifold, we have twice as many F-term uh, relations as uh, the ones that we would have for n equal to 4. And not only they are twice as many, so this is, let's say, the one set, and this is the orbifold image of that. They are also sprinkled with this kappa, this ratio between the two coupling constants. And that's why they are quantum. So this here, this cancels, and this is sort of a classical uh, plane, but this is really quantum. And again, you can do the same trick. You can say, oh, I replace the epsilon of n equal to 4 super young mills by the tensor that I'm looking for. And you can read it off from the Lagrangian, no problem. And the moment you do that, you immediately plug in this relation that the mathematicians told you, and you get the R matrix. 
And maybe note one thing, and by the way, in my notation, this is the one part of the Lagrangian, and this is the mirror image of the other under Z2. So this part that corresponds to this epsilon tensor is Z2 conjugate with this part that comes from here. And Z2 conjugate means you send kappa to 1 over kappa. That's what it means. So this is the, sim this is the symmetry of the, of the theory. And let's elaborate a little bit. So just by what we wrote here, or just by looking at the R matrix, you see that for the XY sector, which was the easy alternating sector, the R matrix comes out to be proportional to the identity. And what does this mean? This means that this is a rational model with a full SU2. But we know that this is the SU2 R symmetry of n equal to two superconformal algebra. So this is good. Nice. Here, for the XZ sector, the more complicated dilute model, uh, this SU2 R symmetry is now broken. At least naively, we say that it's broken. But what we say here, and this is like the whole, uh, you know, the poem that we say all of this time, is that this gets upgraded to a quantum group. That's what's going on. And uh, just by having the R matrix and splitting it into two in this precise way, we read off the Drinfeld twist from this equation. And it's given here. Of course, uh, this form uh, implies a normalization, which we can undo whenever we like. But there is some normalization there, and we have the Drinfeld twist. Sorry. The fact that you have a different signs for, let's say, beta in the two copies looks like something that can be reabsorbed by a change of basis. So There is a lot about the basis there. There is a lot about the basis. Okay. So this is in a very specific choice of basis, which mm -hmm. is precisely this basis. Like here or here. Mm -hmm. A, a, and you know, this is the basis that makes sense when you have a superconformal field theory. Why? Because XX type of guys, they are the vacuum. So I want XX to be killed by some sigma plus. And then I want ZZ to be killed by some sigma minus. Okay? Mm -hmm. I want my, my Felder like quantum algebra. Okay. It is very crucial. So I insist on this basis, yes. It is 8 by 8 because here I write in full glory all the possible color indices. And here I use this dynamical notation where by then further saying that the first open index is 1 or 2, I go to this upper part or to this lower part. Take, take the microphone because maybe it's good also for the camera. Um, yes, so can you uh, identify the symmetry algebra of the uh, 8 times 8, or is there some... Yes, so that's a very good question. I will say a tiny little bit, and in general I will try to avoid, because I will have to go very mathematical. So the first layer answer, if you push me more, I maybe will try to say more, is that on this part, which is this, we have a quantum as U2 with quantum deformation kappa, on this part, we have another quantum as U2 with quantum deformation 1 over kappa. And to which of these, uh, you know, how they combine is dictated by the Hilbert space on which we act. And you can try to push me, but okay, maybe later for more words. So this is where we are. We are at the point that we just have a Drinfeld twist and a quasi hopf symmetry algebra. Yes? Now, this is all great. And in some ways, uh, sense, maybe a mathematician would be very happy. But I am a physicist. And I want to see the multiplets. So from now on, the goal is to see the multiplets. I want to see the particles coming together in the bigger than expected multiplets with my hands. Yes? So the first task, and maybe also many people in this audience are actually, in, they know these papers very well. So I was actually very much inspired by these papers when I did this, when I started at least doing this. So these are for the beta deformed mostly. So the first thing that I want to do, I want to write my co-product. So R is the R symmetry generator. 
Naively, this was there for n equal to four super young males. The, this, the fact that there is this index and this hatted index, this would mean one and two of the n equal to four are symmetry, and this would mean three and four. Uh, so these are the broken generators. So I am looking for a coproduct that is a rewriting of this. It can, it can be obtained by having this twist that can be written in this beautiful form. This is what I'm looking for. And this is very easy. You can just do that. It's a very like one line exercise. Now, the moment you discover that you can actually write something like that, uh, you can first ask, is my Lagrangian invariant under this? And the answer is yes. You can check your, like the superpotential is the non-trivial part. You can check that the superpotential is invariant under this. And in fact, there is even some ambiguity. You can even write a few different things that allow uh, for this thing to happen. And not only that, then you can start building multiplets by multiplets. First, for example, you can start with SU2 multiplets that, you know, the broken SU2 that was not supposed to be there, then move to the SU3 and then to the SU4. And eventually, okay, this we do not have yet. We want to have the full supergroup. Mm. But this is also like what Arkady asked. Actually, just because of having this plus n equal to one supersymmetry is enough to guarantee this. So in some sense, this will just be a tedious uh, writing out everything. We don't really have to do it. So, yes. Uh, in the ordinary case, uh, <coughs> this should reduce to some Youngian invariance, right? So you, we will not have that now. What we, we will have now is an elliptic toroidal. Sure, sure, but if you were to take the limit k to equals to one, let's say. Yes, yeah. then you get the Youngian, and this is precisely the Youngian that uh, the orbifolds enjoy. Mm -hmm. So but k is equal to one is the orbifold uh, limit that you know and mm -hmm. love. Because I remember that in that case, there was this work of uh, Niklas and uh, Alexander Carus. It was pretty subtle, I think, right, to check the invariance of the, of the Lagrangian. I mean, they had some papers okay, on that. Okay, good. So this is as subtle as what they have. Uh, so it's maybe it's slightly similar, harder, it's similar to that, what it they did. It's basically, so Garus is the, same, the paper for the beta deformed. Yes. So it, it's basically the same level of difficulty. Okay. Once you know how to do the one, you can do the other. In our case, the only extra difficulty is we keep track of the color indices a little bit more and the coupling constants. But you can really follow. This is just a calculation. Uh, could you say again about uh, possible dual interpretation? Because this quiver is definitely is quite complicated on the uh, dual side. I mean, it's complicated, it's but also... The orbifold point is simple. At a naive level, is uh, very easy. So, so would you expect the same symmetry somehow built in? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. If you, if you knew what's the string dual. I mean, naively, the string dual is ADS5 cross S5 mod Z2 yeah. with the B field. And the B field is maybe so I can. Is that true? Yes. So this should be true. So this is the B field. Sorry. Ba, 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 ba. Where is it? So that's the only extra equation you need to know. Back reaction and deform. This is kind of. I think yeah, there cannot be back reaction from this because this is a constant B field. And for example, when you plug in supergravity equations of motion, H, which is what appears, always cancels. So this will do nothing. Yes. So I know that there is a paper by Aharoni and friends back from the 99, maybe which say that this is good. Okay, yes, 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 yes. And also, I have to say, I haven't done any calculations. I'm just telling what is the dictionary. I mean, honestly, it would be really amazing that we start uh, looking at these things now. This will be part of the outlook. OK, so this is where we are. And let's, OK, let's just look at multiplets. And for this talk and for the first paper that will come out, I only do BPS multiplets. But now we are also, I will tell you, slowly are working on all type of multiplets. It's just that you, know, you just need to do it you know, case by case and over and over again. So here is an example of a broken SU2. So naively, not a multiplet. But what happens is that it is a multiplet. 
So this operator is a sort of a baryonic operator, and this belongs in a specific n equal to 2 representation algebra. And this, for example, is a, a completely different but also highest weight state of the n equal to 2 superconformal algebra. But now that we have this nice uh, twisted coproduct, we can act with it and we can create all the intermediate states all the way from here to here and all the way back up. So this is as consistent of a multiplet as you would ever hope in your life. This is what we learn in quantum mechanics with just a more horrible coproduct. And what is also really cool, so back in the day when I was doing my PhD, we sat down and we diagonalized the Hamiltonian by brute force just because our PhD advisor told us that we need to do this. And we got this crazy, uh, you know, kappa, kappa sprinkled forms for the states. With a coproduct, you can get everything up to all the factors completely, beautifully everything. So for me, when I got that, that was amazing. So this is how the SU2 multiplet works. And you can do the same thing for SU3 multiplets, but okay, I don't do it because I don't want to have to draw, you know, bigger dimensional things. But you can do it the way, the same way we learn uh, SU3 when we learn the eightfold thingy. So you can draw these beautiful multiplets as long as you use your coproduct. And then what was actually, this is something that took some time because then we really need to make sure that we can embed properly SU2 and SU3 inside the SU4. And why this is hard? Because SU2 and SU3, we were only looking at holomorphic operators. But now you really need to look also at non-holomorphic operators. And you need to get all of the reality conditions right. But now we have it. So naively, this is the 20 prime multiplet of n equal to 4 super young mills. And this is a proper multiplet the moment you set the coupling constants to be equal, or if you wish, you don't orbifold even. But now, we want to say that this is a proper multiplet of the full quantum group. First of all, let me just say that this green uh, SU2 is the SU2 R symmetry of the n equal to 2 representation theory, and we know that we have it. So moving in this multiplet in these ways is guaranteed from the n equal to 2 supersymmetry. There is nothing to check there. Of course, we check it for notations and for normalizations, but it's guaranteed. The point is the blue. So the blue is done with the broken generators after you upgrade them to quantum with your new coproduct. And the point is that you can really go and do all these steps and build, build this multiplet completely. And this multiplet, for the people that don't know, this is the stress energy tensor multiplet of n equal to 4 super young mills. So this is the scalar that begins the multiplet of the stress energy tensor. This is the n equal to 2 chiral ring, the Coulomb branch operators. This is these mesons that are uh, on the Higgs branch of n equal to 2 theories. And magically, they are all in one multiplet, a, a new quantum multiplet. Did I say everything that I wanted? Yes. Now, here is the conjecture. Also, I want to insist, what I did, I mean, I, I really used this very specific theory. But what I did, it was just orbifold and marginally deform. So I will make a very strong conjecture, which I really believe is true, that all theories that you can get from n equal to 4 super young mills with less supersymmetry via orbifolding or orientifolding or whatever, but in this direction. So break our symmetry in a way uh, from the mother n equal to four theories. They are all uh, enjoying a quantum deformation of the n equal to four supergroup. This is the conjecture. And all the naively broken generators of the PSU 2 comma 2 slash 4, they get upgraded to quantum generators. And there should be a way to do this and do also this. And again, the way you break our symmetry is the way that you just, the, the break, way you break supersymmetry is the way that you first you break our symmetry. So you do something to the five sphere and you leave the ADS5 part alone. Okay. 
No, no. So, when the theory is not super symmetric, there is a double trace deformations and these are very bad. Yeah, no, so don't do that. Yes. So, super symmetric, super symmetric, so that we have BPS happiness. Good. So, and here is a summary, like a more visual maybe summary. So, n equal to 4 super young mills, when you look at the F terms, they are like classical planes and they have SO6 symmetry. But now we have some cone. So, we, we break this nice SO6 naively. But then, by writing down the F terms and looking at them as quantum planes, we discover in precisely this way the quantum, if you wish, SO6 or quantum SU4. And the way is the precisely way I described. First, you write down the R matrix, then you plug into the RTT. So, th th this is my summary that guarantees that it should work for any JM finishing. Yeah. So then you have your uh, nice quantum group. It's very easy, as I showed you. You just split the R matrix into two, and you get your Drinfeld twist. Of course, you always have to choose your basis nicely, and you choose your basis according to superconformal representation theory. And then the moment you have your Drinfeld, this you have a guaranteed quasi hope uh, happiness. Okay, so this is a summary because this talk was only about this multiplets, which I'm very proud of, but there is much more to do. So first of all, I only discussed this Z2 quiver, but by now we can do the full uh, family of A-type orbifolds, so Z, K, we can just do the same thing for all of them. And it's basically the same, you just have K copies of the same thing, and it just works the same way. We are now in a process of, uh, you know, going, uh, you know, delta is equal to two, delta is equal to three, and just constructing multiplets. For example, we can do six times six, and we have one plus 15 plus 20 prime. 20 prime I showed you is a BPS multiplet, but 15 also, we can also do the 15, and it's a non-BPS, and we can just do it. And then, you know, you just continue. I mean, okay, I don't think I would want to do much more than maybe four of them but just continue doing. And uh, in some sense, we are experimentally discovering the representation theory of this quantum group now. In, uh, in the paper that I cited before with Costas and Randall, we, we studied this 15 vertex model. And this is like, this is a whole uh, thing that th there are a lot of things that need to be done there. So we have a fo very formal definition for what is this 15 vertex model, but now we really need to solve it. We really need, these are, you know, anyway, we really need to do this. Uh, another thing that we have, which is very nice because you can compare all your results, we have an explicit coordinate beth ansatz study. And uh, actually, this was the first thing that I did sort of almost, I don't know, six, seven years ago. I was calculating, you know, what happens to, you know, collide, and I, I found this equation, and I was like, oh, whoa, wa wait, this, is, this was a one-loop calculation, but I got this square root that we know from n equal to four for all loops. So what is going on? So this is one loop. Why the sign is minus? Uh, this is how the sign is. Yes, but, uh, yes, but, but it's very similar. So if you put uh, whatever, some number of kappa squared minus the g squared, you get the same. Yeah. For kappa is equal to one, we expect these are the orbifolds. I guess you got the cost, right? You, you, you yeah. need to, yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah, yes, 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 yes. And okay, there is also some uh, work in progress with Anna and with Marius when we look at this crazy, I mean, simpler XY sector and try to construct brute force Q3s. And so this is another approach. Just brute force, can you get it? Uh, good. And then, I mean, I really want the answer, right? I really want the answer of is this integrable, yes or no? And the way I am going, so you do the six times six, then you do this. Then, when you learn, you, you say, can I compare the two twists, the 6, 6, how it goes to 6, 6, 6. This basically experimentally gives for you the so-called cocycle condition. So the moment I have my cocycle condition, I can ask, is this beast integrable, yes or no? That's, that's, the, that's the way. 
So this will formally answer this question. And then everything that we know and love uh, from n equal to 4 should just go through. It's basically really the same. And uh, again, for n equal to 1 theories, there are very similar things. The vertex model changes. It can in more generally become 19 vertex. But maybe this is even better because Corepin has a, So anyway, maybe this is even better. And, uh, and these are some, OK, please, Arkady, <laughs> let's understand the gravity dual. Uh, yes, this would be the, I think at this stage, this is one of the most important things. <laughs> But I have these very old papers, actually with Mitev, back in the days when I was here and my beginning uh, days of Hamburg, where we, I mean, I had this crazy conjecture always that this, there is this exact effective coupling. So for many things like the Wilson loop, yeah, you replace the n equal to 4 coupling with a function. Yes, yes. yes. But now we know this crazy be, uh, J blah, blah. Maybe we can really do this now. Yes. And there are two other very cute ways to go in the problem. The one is the Costello style, which actually I think we know quite a lot. So this should be possible to do. And the other thing also very recently, uh, Francesco wrote with Matthias, uh, uh, the, you know, the, 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 uh, the string uh, dual to the free n equal to two. So now we just need to learn how to do the quantum string dual by putting the n equal to two multiplets together in quantum n equal to four. Yes. So we see that time, yeah. Uh, yeah, Ellie, thanks for a nice talk. Um, so I, I'm a little bit familiar with this work by Zubos and his PhD student at the time, Dlamini, yes. about like uh, the beta deformation and, and the more general marginal yes. deformations. You, so you expect this whole story to, to apply in that, the, that context the or not? The whole story goes through identically. The only extra bit of difficulty is this idea of dynamical. Mm -hmm. So w when I am writing these matrices, you know, w w let's co really compare. So they, what they have is really you replace this epsilon by one epsilon. Mm -hmm. So the only difference now is that you have one, two, because this is the Z2 orbifold. And this guy by this guy are related by a Z2 symmetry. So each bit here is identically what was done in that paper, or at least the procedure, not the answer. Sure. The answer is different. But the, the reason I'm asking is because, I mean, the, their results also cover the, the beta deformation for imaginary beta, for example. Yes, and yes. In that case, I mean, it's known that, that the string jewel is known, and it's known that that is not classically integrable so in First the, in of all, I, I, I want to, to say that whatever we have said in the past that it's mm -hmm. not integrable, we should think a second time because I think no one in this community ever thought about Felder type things. No, I sure, think sure. we really need to be careful about this statement. Right. But then so I don't ex uh, accept any statement of non-integrability by now. Okay, but then I mean... <laughs> I only accept statements of integrability. Okay, but it's, I mean, yes. it's, it's been shown that these, these models admit, like, uh, reductions to particle motion, which show chaotic behavior. So sure. it, it cannot so be classical can do, integrability If you in can do something side. like that, it might work. Yes, it might work. I mean, there might also be a, a different way in which integrability yes. is realized in some way, but then do you have any idea how the, that the, the only thing that I have to say is that elliptic integrability is a very scary beast, mm -hmm. and it's really not something we are used to. So we really need to retrain ourselves very much to be able to see it. Is there okay. any model where this elliptic integrability would be under control even a toy model? I think the most toy model is the XYZ spin chain, and it's already a very scary thing. And, and there are also all the, like, Piers and uh, Varnar and all of these crazy guys in the 80s, they have... Uh, like uh, a production, yeah. Yeah, hello. I'm um, sorry I walked in about a couple of minutes late, and, uh, and when I no did problem. walk in, you were talking about elliptic solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation. Yes. 
but the rest of your talk, they all seem to be rational R matrices. Uh, where, where, where is the, what was the role of the elliptic yes. <laughs> solution here? Actually, in some way, the elliptic is already here. So this is already the elliptic, uh, uh, but I didn't say. Really? Because the elliptic has like two, the, yeah, the yeah, two so parameters, yes, yes, uh, yes. So not just a Q. Yes, there's, yes, there's a yes. gnome and there's a, yes, yes. You know, it's period, doubly periodic, etc. It, yes, yes. it looks very different. Yeah, uh, yeah, it, 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 in, first of all, the, the reason why this does not look elliptic is that this is, uh, I take uh, the rapidity and I set it to one of the two periods. Uh. So, and then, of course, so this is, uh, this is the braid limit of the R matrix. Ah, uh, OK, yeah, yeah, this yeah. So but, the, but you're going matrix. to a rational limit somehow. Exactly, exactly. Uh, OK, so you're fixing the, okay, Because okay. right now, the only thing that I was trying to do is I wanted to pull out the quantum group out of nothing. Right, right. The moment I understand this, then I want to Baxterize. Yeah, and that's going to have to be deformed uh, to, yes. to include the gnome or whatever you want to call it yes, in the yes. elliptic. OK, thank you. More questions? Yeah. So when you wrote the coproduct, you said that there, were, there was some ambiguity there. Is there any meaning for the ambiguity? And you had the, any particular reason to choose this one? Or so is there yes. any funda so anything fundamental about yes. it? Yes, so it looks like there are two classes of coproducts that go. Yes. Uh, so okay, of course, there is always normalization, right? But I don't even think about that. Uh, the one coproduct looks uh, like it's natural when you study holomorphic things because what it basically does is you can actually kill either this guy or this guy and put it to one. In fact, people do this also when they do XXZ. One way of writing the coproduct is having here a one and here having Q to the J3. Uh, so this is the one way. The Someone said something? No. Uh, the other actually is me very crazy, and I have to say I don't understand it, because uh, these functions are somehow, they look complicated. Maybe we, can, uh, maybe we can look at them together, but it looks highly non-trivial, and I have no idea why this other way is allowed. Yeah, Ellie, just yes. uh, maybe it might be a bit outside, but I'm just wondering, when you uh, sort of two questions. When you say you want to consider less supersymmetric setups, yes. like uh, n less than four, and you say that uh, that's a bit generic set, and of course we w could expect some quantum realizations of certain symmetries in these reduced cases. You, you, you want to expect something concrete with this Beyond this, as you yes, so Nicholas' it, prescription, it, it, it is really, really how I said this. You, so the the homework is you always write down your f terms. So, for example, if we do an n equal to one preserving or befold, yeah. the most simple is a Z three one with three nodes, right? You will have three quantum plane images. Yeah. You will basically, so this will define for you three different, this model will be, by the way, hyper elliptic already. It will be a torus mm -hmm. with two holes. So already we need more advanced theta functions, not just the normal, but okay. And uh, I mean, yeah, I can just do the same. I can write down these things. I can write down this. I can write yeah, down. Yeah. yeah, I'm probably also asking the context if you can go beyond this uh, two part tight quiver. Like if you go to toric diagrams, we have which have higher degrees, like so dimension three. So everything that can be written with a toric diagram, or equivalently, I had this in my conjecture somewhere. And all these colors are samely satisfied? So as long as you can construct an n equal to one theory with a brain tiling of Hanani, yeah, okay. I think you win. If you give me a brain tiling, I can give you the vertex model. Any more questions? Maybe a uh, naive question. So suppose you look at orbifold point uh, with equal couplings. You have twisted sect and twisted sect. So now you deform. Are you looking at all states? Yes. So it's not just deformation of twisted sect. No, so you're all. claiming integrability in the whole. All. And you can see this very clearly uh, here. So a state that has only Zs in it is an untwisted state. But a state that has uh, X and Y is crazy twisted. Uh, 
let me ask you. There is another yeah, question. Yeah, I, I, okay. saw, I saw there are a few. I just wanted to use my prerogative to ask more. <laughs> That's not very nice. <laughs> <laughs> then I'll give them the floor. Um, again, about, uh, and we already discussed it, but I'm very thick, about this multiple split thing. If you can show again the, the thing. Yes. So. Yeah, this is my favorite picture these days. So my confusion is, uh, is the claim that the actual spectrum of uh, the full theory would uh, uh, would organize in this way, where basically you have this arrow corresponding to yes. the form of product? Yes. Because the thing that confuses me is, I thought that the shift in the energy levels of things that used to be the sentence or the under the ordinary symmetry before you, the form and everything, actually get corrected in a very like non-algebraic, non like you know, non-rational way, no, like it involves so zetas and so on. Who, whoever in this is in this multiplet uh, has the same uh, energy. Well, no, when you go down, normally even in the, in the form theory, you, no, no. you increase by one, Wh right? When you go down, you move uh, in our symmetry space, not, uh, in, uh, the, not uh, by the, the dilatation of yeah, the Yeah, and I, I guess I'm thinking about delta minus j, so that would be like... Uh, so, right. so so delta stays the same, yeah. and our symmetry changes when you move here. And you say that it changes by something that is, uh, uh, I mean, it's something that is determined by the commutation relation of your Q deform algebra. Uh, absolutely, right? yes. And absolutely. you're saying that this shift is always the same, like, you know, that something that used to be a descendant will change. There is no change. shift on delta, that's what I'm saying. There is mm -hmm. no shift on delta. And the shift on delta minus j is just something that follows simply I by It here. follows simply by, basically, here this yeah. axis yeah i don't know i still find uh, this a little bit difficult to reconcile with the fact that even in simpler theory like uh, beta deform what used to be a descendant acquires anomalous dimensions that are very complicated to express yeah, yeah we talked about this yeah. so for the beta deform first of all here this is just a calculation and mm -hmm. there's no discussion it's a clear sure. calculation for the beta deform as we discussed most probably, and because actually also we had a difficulty with this guy to fix this mm -hmm. guy, and we had to do something really careful. Mm -hmm. We had to change the open chain boundary conditions in order so to get So it's in the that. boundary conditions. So for the better deform, maybe we didn't need to rethink carefully how we choose. And you see, this, this is clear. So when you write the Lagrangian of X, uh, uh, XXZ, mm -hmm. uh, not the Lagrangian, the Hamiltonian, and when you write the La Hamiltonian of temporary lib, if you use this Hamiltonian, you will never see the quantum as you do, just never. If you use the temporary Lib Hamiltonian, you will see the quantum as you do. So the quantum as you do Hamiltonian, uh, temporary Lib commutes with the quantum as you do. The other one doesn't. So it's very possible that the way you write the open uh, spin chain mm -hmm. Hamiltonian for the beta deformed is not a good way, and you need to slightly change your boundary mm -hmm. conditions, and then you will win. Okay. Of course, you need to change the boundary conditions in a way that it's actually allowed, right? So that when you close, you get the right operators. Mm -hmm. yeah, very quick question. So uh, you think, um, so you, spot, you talked about coordinate beta answers at some point, right? Mm. You think one can set up the calculation of um, uh, overlaps of, uh, of beta states? Okay, this is so much later. Later, eh? Yeah, I mean, first we need to do baby beta answers. <laughs> Uh, hello, thank you for the nice talk. Uh, actually, I was curious about uh, the comment on the final slide about the connection to uh, four-dimensional Jen Simons theory because yes. for the Jen Simons theory, if you take the um, spectral curve to be a torus and you, you study the um, 2D effective yes. theory, you get the BF theory. So yes. I was wondering whether it's a, a, a BF-like theory yes. uh, with the model light dependence. So I was wondering whether you already know, you can already see the relation between your story and that story. Okay, I, 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 I have to say, I don't, if I could do it in five minutes, I would have done it, yes? So I cannot do it in five minutes. Okay. But what is clear to me is that you should be able to take this paper or you should be able to take the paper with uh, Yamazaki, Costello, and Witten. There mm -hmm. they tell you, you replace the plane by a torus and you win. So it should be basically as simple as that. Of course, mod uh, whatever difficulty will come up when you really calculate. But okay. it's, th this is the spirit. I see, I see. And th that should really work, actually. OK, OK, thank you. OK, I think that we had already a very large number of questions, very interesting talk. So let's thank Ellie again for the talk and the answer. <laughs>